Alright everyone, hello hello. Today we are going to talk about some really easy substitutions you can do in cooking if for whatever reason you run out of some things while you're in the middle of a recipe. By the way, if you want to see these videos two weeks earlier, consider subscribing to my Patreon where you not only get all these videos, but also recipe cards, uh, specific deity profiles, and lots of other interesting things to look at. Video tiers start at $10 a month, so definitely consider checking it out. I know this happens to me all the time where I'm just about to start cooking and I look around and I realize I don't have a key ingredient, like something as silly as tomato paste, lemon zest, egg, milk, any of these kinds of things that it turns out, oh, actually you need for this recipe. Nothing makes me more angry than getting to that point and realizing the store is closed and I don't know what to do. But it turns out there are a lot of really easy substitutions uh, that also won't really impact your magic too much. So let's start with the easy ones. Now the first one I'm gonna talk about is something that I honestly do like literally all the time, and that is replacing milk and also sour cream with Greek yogurt. So with sour cream, it's honestly really easy to just use one-for-one one Greek yogurt, and that's because it's still got the same flavor profile, right? That sour flavor, it's still dairy, and if you get Greek yogurt that does have any fat in it, it can replace the fat content. I usually get uh, zero-fat Greek yogurt, so it's not as, I guess, rich as it might be. You might want to add a little more oil to something, but in cases like uh, recipes with beef stroganoff, this is great. Same thing with any kind of chicken taco bowls or anything else. Instead of a dollop of sour cream, a dollop of this. And it's not even really to be healthy. <laughs> Honestly, it's just because I use sour cream so infrequently, but I do always have a use for Greek yogurt. And with milk, especially if I'm baking something and obviously like vanilla almond milk isn't going to be right in it, all I do is I take a little bit of Greek yogurt and I add a little bit of water to make it about the same consistency as regular milk. And it works like a charm every time. And obviously, magically, that stays pretty easy because it's all still dairy, so it all still works pretty much the same way. Whatever you would use milk for magically in a recipe, you can use the yogurt for exactly the same. Another one that's honestly a pantry staple and that you really don't want to run out of is tomato paste, right? So tomato paste is something I use in things like goulash and other such recipes, spaghetti, but occasionally I lose track of how many I actually have, and so sometimes I do run out. And when that happens, honestly, the easiest thing to do is just open up a regular jar of sauce if you have it. It's just plain old spaghetti sauce. Um, it does have a little bit of basil in it, so if you can find a plain one, that is better because you can customize it better. But this is pretty much all that tomato paste really is. Tomato paste is just extremely concentrated tomato. When you add water to it, it's going to start acting like tomato sauce again. So if you have a recipe that calls for this, and all you have is this, just cut some of the water out of your recipe and you'll end up pretty much with the same idea. And if you have fresh tomatoes laying around, you can even use those. You just cut them up a little bit and toss them in. But again, you're definitely going to want to reduce the amount of water in your meal. This releases a lot of water when it cooks and you're going to end up with a big soupy mess if that's not what you were intending. Other really easy swaps are especially when it comes to fresh herbs, right? If you ever go to the store and you go to get some herbs, you'll notice that things like this with the fresh herbs are kind of expensive and honestly there's not a lot of recipes that really directly call for fresh herbs. The only thing I could use like say fresh mint for is in salads where it matters or like a mojito or some kind of drink. Otherwise if you don't really need it to be fresh because you're making a sauce or something like that, just go with the dried stuff. Just get dried herbs. This is actually dill but the same idea applies. Generally the consensus is if you're using one tablespoon of fresh herbs then one teaspoon of dry herbs will do the pretty much the same thing flavor-wise. So you don't need to go overboard with it. Dried herbs are a bit more potent, and so you don't need as much. Now, say you're baking something, and you need a little bit of lemon zest, like one lemon's worth of zest, but you don't want to go all the way to the store to get lemon zest. Honestly, this right here, a lemon extract, this will save you, because yeah, it's a little expensive, I mean, it is an extract, and it does kind of have a slightly almost artificial lemony like flavor in things, but a little goes a long way, and it is a really good replacement for zest. It's also uh, a lot more shelf stable, you get a lot more out of it. So, you know, this is probably like dozens of lemons just in this little bottle, because you only need like a few drops, you don't need a lot. And because of that, 
you could save yourself the hassle of the zesting, the trip down to the grocery store, and then ending up with a skinless lemon that you don't know what to do with afterwards. Extracts are awesome. I just don't bake often enough to justify having a ton of lemons all the time, so absolute lifesaver is having those kinds of things around. A couple more easy ones and then we'll get into the more interesting substitutions for typical ingredients. But one of those, honestly, is cornstarch. You'll see a lot of recipes advocate for you to use a cornstarch slurry where you mix a little bit of cornstarch with like a teeny bit of water so you don't get any lumpy bumpies and so it kind of thickens up sauces and soups and other things like that. Or say if you're making beef stew, you might sprinkle this on the meat while it's cooking, it'll coat it, it'll make it uh, overall thicker and more hearty. Sure. Uh, but if you don't have cornstarch just laying around, because honestly, it's not that common an ingredient, I guess. I mean, it shows up a lot, but you don't need to have it. A great way to substitute this is with regular flour. And personally, I prefer that because cornstarch adds a weird flavor to it. It never really ends up being exactly the same. You can tell when someone used cornstarch in something, and I don't like that. So what I do instead is rather than make a slurry at the very end of a meal, I will just pinpoint a point in the meal, say if I'm making beef stroganoff, where I can literally just add some flour in, right? I would say you would need a little bit more flour than you do cornstarch. Cornstarch is pretty powerful. So if you're using like one tablespoon of cornstarch, I would use two, two and a half of regular all-purpose flour. You can get these pretty big bags of flour at your big box stores and because, you know, if you bake a lot too, you're going to be using this anyway. You're going to be using it probably a lot more than you ever will cornstarch. So if you're at the point, say in beef stew, where you are browning the meat and you're noticing the water come out, or if you're doing that with beef stroganoff and likewise noticing the water come out of the mushrooms and stuff, that's the point where you sprinkle in some flour and you stir it around until it becomes almost paste-like. And then you just add in the rest of your liquid a little bit slowly, a little at a time, so you can make sure you still have a really nice, thick, hearty sauce without needing to resort to what is basically a cornstarch hack at the end. When it comes to magic, obviously cornstarch is made of corn, and this here is made out of wheat, and they're both grains, so they still have that same magical aspect of abundance and fertility and all these other things. Good news about a lot of these replacements is that they actually carry a lot of the similar themes of magic too, so you really don't need to worry about that so much when you're looking for a replacement. But that isn't always the case, for instance, butter. This is a dairy item, and if you want to replace it, the general consensus is to use a neutral vegetable oil or something like margarine. And there's no like serious rule for that, but generally people also do suggest to use a little bit less uh, oil than you would butter. So if you're using like, according to one source, 10 tablespoons of butter, maybe use seven and a half tablespoons of oil. Or you could even mix half applesauce and half oil together for a richer consistency. And this is especially good for like batters and other things like that. I wouldn't use the applesauce trick if you were making like a roux. But now another bit of good knowledge to have, uh, especially when it comes to cooking in general, like actual meals, like coco vin, if you are someone who for some reason cannot find, purchase, or cannot have alcohol, see, you know, in coco vin, red wine is really important. You can actually replace red wine with the same amount of grape juice or cranberry juice. Likewise, with white wine, you can replace it with the same amount of like a white grape juice or even apple juice. You still kind of get that acidity. There is going to be more sugar though, so you do have to be mindful of that. But given the magical associations of wine are drawing on grape anyway, using grape juice is honestly the perfect substitution. You could also get those cooking wines and things at the store that don't really have like actual alcohol in them. They're not meant for drinking. But if you want to avoid alcohol in your house altogether, Grape juice is a possible substitution that still carries all those same magical qualities. So let's get into our more interesting substitutions now. And one of the things that people might need to substitute uh, on a typical day is definitely Worcestershire sauce. Worcestershire? I don't really know how to say this. That's okay. Worcestershire sauce. This is a fish-based sauce. It does have anchovies in it. Um, so it's not vegan or anything like that. And it has those associations of the fish as it is. But, in a pinch, and I have done this before and it does work, if you combine soy sauce, ketchup, and a little bit of sugar, and maybe some vinegar, you can actually get something pretty close to this flavor profile. And on top of that, it'll be vegan, which is pretty good. 
one time I was making beef stroganoff and I did realize that I had run out of uh, Worcestershire sauce at the last second. I was very upset. So I just kind of jumped onto Google and I said, what can I use to replace this? And Google provided the answer. So now I too will provide you that answer. If you're ever looking for this and you don't have it, no problem. If you've got ketchup, if you've got sugar, if you've got maybe soy sauce, you're good. You're totally fine. But it is a lot easier to just have this on hand, I will admit. And when you replace it that way, you can start adding the associations of the soy, of the tomato, and all those other things. Unless you were specifically looking to get the anchovy associations out of the Worcestershire sauce, I don't really think you got to worry about it that much when it comes to how it impacts your magic. Now where I think we're going to have a lot of fun is actually when it comes to figuring out how to replace your eggs. As you know, eggs do have an association with life and rebirth and transformation and all these other kinds of things. So magically, it is pretty big if you're looking for that theme in your baked goods or even in your casual meals. However, sometimes we just don't have eggs on hand. Sometimes we run out, sometimes you're like me and you boiled all of your eggs for Easter, but sometimes you don't have raw eggs just hanging out for whatever reason. There are actually a lot of things you can do to replace this if you know what it does in a loose batter. Like say you're making muffins or pancakes or brownies. This is where it's really good to be using these kinds of substitutions I'm about to tell you. You could do it with cake too, but it's gonna be kind of weird because what eggs do is they bind, they lift, and they provide flavor. So when it comes to replacing egg, uh, there are a few different things you can do. It depends on what you're trying to do. But generally, one of the first things you can do is actually use mayonnaise because mayonnaise is made out of oil and eggs. So if you have a recipe that calls for a certain amount of fat on top of the eggs, that's okay. You can just instead cut back on some of the oil and use mayonnaise instead. It's still egg, it's still oil, it's all in one. So if you have a big bucket of helmet that's just laying around, you can do that. Another thing you can do is use some kind of fruit puree, whether that's like uh, applesauce, some mashed banana, a quarter of a cup of this fruit, or like, you know, pre-arrayed prunes or raisins or anything. This can also uh, provide some of that flavor and some of that binding structure because it is wet and sticky, right? That fruit is kind of, all that sugar pulls it together, the water pulls it together, just the way that in egg whites, uh, you know, proteins and liquids in it will. You could also use full fat yogurt because, you know, just like an egg has protein in the white and it's got fat in the yolk, full fat yogurt uh, is also binding. It's, you know, viscous, it's kind of liquidy, but it's not like water. It also does have that fat element, so it's gonna bring that flavor and it does still have protein in it because it's a dairy item, so it's gonna provide some of that lift too. That's what an egg does in terms of lifting. The protein is what really gives it that structure. Other things you can do actually include using um, aquafaba, which is the liquid of like a can of chickpeas. Rather than throwing that liquid out, you can actually save it and you can whip it just like you would egg whites for a meringue. You can use it in place of egg white, you know, things like that. It's super, super interesting that you can do that with that. And that's because chickpeas themselves, you know, they have protein in them. They have those starches in them that make them capable of kind of acting like egg whites. Generally, three tablespoons of that liquid will replace one egg, right? So one bit of egg white. You can also even use chickpea flour, in which you could use like a quarter of a cup of chickpea flour and an extra quarter of a cup of water or some kind of liquid. The only caveat is that by itself, it does taste gross apparently from what I hear. I've never tried it, but I hear it just tastes gross on its own. But if you cook it, it gets better, allegedly. Don't take my word for it, I've never tried it, but it is an option. I've even heard some people say you can make an omelette with it, which is very creative and experimental and probably something I'm not ever going to do. <laughs> Just saying. But here's where things get interesting. So, learning new things every day, but baking soda... I mean, this can also replace your egg and even your yeast. If for whatever reason you don't have instant yeast on hand and you really need some, I mean, think about any like traditional science projects for kids, right? Where you put all this baking soda in a volcano and you add some kind of acid and it makes a big explosion. Same idea here, basically. It's the same thing. So because it's making all of that uh, carbon dioxide with that reaction, you're gonna get a lot of lift in bread. You don't wanna use too much of that method though. No more than like one egg recipes for that because that vinegar will take over and it'll start making things taste sour. So you don't wanna do that too much. If you are trying to replace instant yeast with this uh, experimental mixture here, the general consensus is one teaspoon of yeast is equal to half a teaspoon of baking soda 
and half a teaspoon of some kind of acid, be it vinegar, be it lemon juice, anything like that. That'll give you that lift you're looking for, but it will impart some sourness, so keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Though again, with all those egg substitutes, magically it's not going to be the same because extremely overripe bananas don't have the same associations as eggs. But that's okay. Egg is like one ingredient in your entire meal, and you can honestly just start drawing on the associations of apple from applesauce or the banana itself instead. You can do all kinds of different things, you just gotta be creative with it, right? Comment down below and tell me what your favorite substitution for something is when you run out. I know that the Greek yogurt uh, hack is always gonna be in my kitchen because I literally never buy milk unless I really, really need to. Like, I will buy a carton of milk to make pizza, but then it just sits there in my fridge because I don't really use it that much. Wherever I can, I'm using the Greek yogurt and water hack, and I'm using Greek yogurt instead of sour cream, because that too will sit in my fridge until it goes moldy, because I never use it for literally anything else. But let me know, and stick around, because next week we're going to be talking all kinds of other things with Kitchen Magic. See ya!